Our next speaker um, is active for Freifunk for a while, and I'm looking forward to the next talk we will have here. Imagine you're left out, enabling digital participation with Freifunk by Jürgen Wintermatt and Metze. Let's go. All right. Um, I'll also say welcome. My name is Jürgen Wintermatt und Menze, and I am indeed active for a while in Freifunk already. Um, on the one side, as a user, but on the other side, I work at an institution where people with cognitive um, limitations live, but they also have a justified interest in participating in life, including digitally, and they're interested in that. And as an institution, we had the problem at some point of how we solve this. And you have this um, state fact for a while that this right on participation doesn't really exist. There's an auxiliary paragraph, which we can see on the slide, a why internet at all. There are legal requirements for uh, providers as part of the integration help. So we have 120, I think, locations in the Rhineland, so we are distributed geographically, and for us as the provider, there is this requirement, the rooms of the people who live here have to have the um, conditions for using telephone and internet, and even before this was in this law, our institution already considered that we should make this available to the people living here, and there's, this is now a very weak uh, legal um, requirement which didn't exist at the time, we still want to do it. And as a larger institution, uh, when we want to do this, it means we have to start some projects. And so I did some research and we're not there for that long, I think. Um, we put the first area production online three years ago. Um, and it was also fired up by the um, German um, general uh, court that they have the internet as a basic right, including some bandwidth. And in our particular case, um, with the people living here, you have to imagine that not all of them uh, can freely uh, leave their houses because there is some kind of closed um, living and they might have some cognitive limitations as well, which means they are uh, required to use their own mobile devices, which have, might have limited volume, which is used up at some point, especially with newer possibilities like YouTube and so on, which means without an internet um, opportunity, our customers have limited ability to communicate and add to that um, these people live on a salary below the um, lowest one with uh, no work, uh, which means they can't afford their own internet connection. And a lot of them also have several um, limitations. And they would like to use therapy offers, which requires an internet connection. Um, and we imagine, thought about how can we implement this whole thing. Maybe quickly about myself. I am working on the IT at this provider. And so this is uh, ended up on my desk at some point, which I liked. And I will talk later about why it became Freifunk or why we chose Freifunk. But uh, one short excursion, maybe on two slides. Lidit Wittmann said at the opening of the CCC that she sees the state as an inhibitor on e government and digital dis um, management. And as someone who is in a public institution, I completely agree. It goes even further. In our particular case, the availability of internet in this um, help institution. There's the um, association FinSOTS, um, who work socially in IT, and there 
it was noticed in November that the digitalization uh, regarding inclusion is almost only concerned with accessibility, so it's also an important subject, of course, um, that all web offers are available without digital barriers, but what is not present is um, the aspect of people living in this uh, assisted living, I think. Um, and we had this on the first slide already, this um, law that I mentioned, and there is no statement there what does enabling them to put it digital participation, there's not really a right to that, which is sad and which also results in, um, as Ms. Whitman said, the state is kind of inhibiting it and for people who want to drive something forward, it makes it a lot more difficult. And I'll talk later about that it is pretty difficult to work there, which I would like to have imagined easier. But it goes on, it goes further. A few of you might know it from teachers' lessons. So something like digital competence is not um, expected in social professions. And both knowing and teaching this most people just have no idea about it. So we work with the Pixel Labs that are also uh, working with teaching people with cognitive disabilities. And our workers, we try to teach them the work to work with the site Cyberfiber uh, from the government and to enable them to teach with that so much for that so maybe a immediate race so if, when I got the topic on my table you start with mind maps and project plans and so on and you check what the stakeholders so the interested parties what are their interests our customers so I talked to them beforehand and we have associations in all of those uh, places and I'll sit down with them and talk to them. It's always good to hear from them directly what they need. So the customers had a lot of interest in internet and surfing of course, no control, no cost, in their own room, in the whole house and without barriers. And without barriers for them meant, you might know it from hotels, to enter credentials, to click every time you want to log in without that. So to find out the interests was rather straightforward. We wanted to offer them internet access. We wanted to have it secure for us judicially and very, very cheap. That's what we wanted. And me and the IT, we would have liked it to have scalable, low administration work, little support work, and of course, have a dependable and SLA, so a service level agreement. So I want to have a number that I can just call when there's a problem, that I can just call and say, there's this problem, I want it solved. Those were the main interests that came together, and we had to bring everything together. So, the IT had these demands oh, uh, to solve, so a connection to the internet, it should be free of cost for the customers, without barriers, without portal that you we have to enter your credentials independent of the device because many of them only have mobile devices it should be secure before the law 
because I didn't want to get any letters from lawyers. It had to be scalable. And we have 120 of these houses in different places, and it had to be done in a way so it doesn't matter if we have three or 120 houses. And it should be cheap. That was the main issue. So barrier free, that was really important because it's both for the workers and for the customers because they were afraid of being interrupted all the time to just help people going online. So that was the main task for us. Having it securely before the law was very important as well. So we are supported by System House and we contacted them beforehand if they could do it and they were out because of the judicial problems. So we needed another solution. I started a very big uh, market check to see what's available. I'm not showing that here, it's too big. So I connect, uh, I put together the cost and we were talking about half a million euro all in all and for us because we have to finance that ourselves. That's a lot of money because we have to would have to find a way to find it out. And yeah, we, we try to get it cheap or cost neutral. So this is difficult. And then I set up a summary of all this had to give it to my bosses and they said, yeah, sure, do it. And then there was this hotspot office by Vodafone Telekom, then others that offered hotspot solution. And I was calculating it for Freifunk, which is a German uh, um, group the name means literally free radio and before I made contact to them I did my calculations I have to say to my shame making contact was only when I had the okay from my bosses so we made contact but basically so I started with the one in Düsseldorf, but then I contacted them when in Neanderland. And why I'll tell you later. So why them? That's first of all because of my own background. So if you compare the cost um, by commercial um, offers, then there's a bit difference already. But you also have to say, we just couldn't have afforded it any other way. Then the possibility of creating benefits and what was important to me is setting up the infrastructure. So setting up the cables, setting up and installing the server rooms and the servers. And that should be independent of the supporter. So I could now pull the plug, throw out Freifunk and switch to a commercial provider. I could do that. It's independent. And now, then everything started for real. As a get, I told, I talked to Düsseldorf first because it's my home city, and went to the meetings. And then it happened. Well, yeah, there is also a forum, and I entered that, became active, and then I found Andreas Stoffer. And he both works with Düsseldorf, but thank God also in Neanderland. And in Düsseldorf, it fell asleep in a way. So they were less active on a doing level. 
So Andreas, he helped me a lot. So we set up the ecosystem. We are using the Fritz box. The one we used is not really available anymore. So there were these telecom boxes, speed ports. We're using them at the moment, just as a DSL modem. Then the Archer C7 was recommended. They, because they are very stable, then Unify APs and switches, and they are so nice and host a Unify controller in the cloud for us. So we have everything in there and that makes our life so much easier. But when we came to the real doing level, then I really had to learn a lot to really work on a command line, on a router. I didn't do that for some 10 years. As a student, yeah, and then sometimes in my free time, but I had to learn a lot. At the beginning, I did the whole project myself. I had to talk to my colleagues a lot, but then talked to Freifunk, and that also included before COVID times, that I also went to their meetings, less than I wanted, but yeah, during COVID it was hardly possible at all, and I hope that soon we can meet again, because that's also something I would like to give back. All right, I think I can skip the next slide. Everyone who listens here knows basically how Freifunk works, with the VPN tunnel and so on and so forth. And then we are at the context of Freifunk already. The pros of why I chose Freifunk were in the beginning it is affordable in this form, so I have the mat material costs and personal costs, which we have anyways. It is a kind of civil engagement, which I also like personally. It is often used in a very stable way in refugee homes and other things. So it's an established system where I was confident that I can handle it. It scales well. And the absolutely best argument is the legal safety security. So it goes through a VPN. So my institution is not appearing in any kind of log file. There is no IP that can be associated. I will go into this later, but if I have issues with Freifunk, I don't need to worry about getting any complaints in. And the, what's against it is you know, there are different local uh, parties we talk to, l different configuration, and there's more effort on the IT side. So Freifunk is always a local association depending on a city or a, a local area. And we have offers going down from the Dutch border down to Neuskirchen. So I would have had to deal with several Freifunk association in these different locations. But the problem is, in many of these areas, there is no Freifunk association anymore. It just uh, died out because, as we will see later, it just doesn't have, doesn't exist anymore. And um, we are our major installation already. And uh, the Freifunk idea is, in my a perception that there are these local associations that take care of the technical side, um, offering it for interested people, as well as the internet access, um, especially for mesh systems. So which means if my neighbor doesn't have an internet connection, then they could mesh through my router and could have internet this way. And this was not an option for us in this form. So. I talked with the uh, people from Freifunk in the Netherlands if it's okay for them, if they just take us, even after we've expanded all the way to the Dutch border. And I uh, arrange the systems the, in such a way that um, they go to the Freifunk uploader with Unify something firmware. Um, but each location I offer, if anyone's interested, I would add another offloader by Freifunk, which is um, capable of meshing, and then 
position it in such a way that people who live close by can mesh with it. So there is this offer on each location. And the sad thing is nobody has asked for it. There were other requests. Um, well, requests, we will come to that as well. All right, and then we're already reaching the lessons learned. So this really, really steep learning curve. I'm buying something that might not be able to be delivered. So I'll skip all this. You can probably imagine this already. And let's go to what we really learned during the project. Number one is it's always about the people who are acting there on both sides. And point two and three, everything, it is always about the people working there. So to say it very clearly, if the people in Five from Niederland, such as Andreas Stefan and what they're all called, if they fall away, then the association would probably also dwindle away and I would have to look for something else. So the firmware is going to keep running for some more time, but eventually it won't. And at the time we chose it, despite knowing this, there is no serving level agreement. I don't have a hotline there. Um, if I send an email to Andreas that he emails in real time, that is due to Andreas being a wonderful person. But if he doesn't want to do it or can't do it anymore at some point, then I will start running into problems, which is the reason why I did the infrastructure in such a way that we can still switch to a commercial provider in an emergency. I don't want to do that, but I need to have a fallback. So we need an active association with active people taking care of things. And so I'm very happy with Neanderfunk in this aspect because it works well there. And I'm also uh, glad to participate in the in their open tables, even if it doesn't happen at the moment. But these associations need uh, stamina and they need to be competent. And if this wanders away because people get older or they get children, they move away or whatever, then these things can start to slide down because it's all voluntary and there is no and nothing you can demand of them and this is something you have to be conscious of on the business side and i also learned uh, which we will come to in lessons learned at the company but we learned what this means and the next thing i just mentioned is there is no service level agreement there is no service level agreement there is no service level agreement there is no 24 7 guarantee and this is something very important we have to communicate to our board and to our customers because if the system breaks then you can guarantee that it's going to happen on friday afternoon when i don't have any time to uh, pay a visit so those are the things i had to learn uh, painfully inside the company it was even worse the things i had to learn so here as well it's always about the people who are acting and doing things and i assume if there aren't people like me who are doing it it wouldn't still wouldn't exist so you need people who drive something and this is something i've learned in all areas of my life of my life so far interestingly we had a lot of resistance along the staff so the people who um, take care of their customers locally in the form that there came these questions can anyone join this can they can they watch uporn and so on and so forth and our answer was yes they can watch uporn yes anyone can log in there was sabotage through um, employees which you have to imagine that um, there are people there who think they know what's best for other people and then they think you have to um, sanction the internet access if someone didn't act well, for instance, which means that devices are unplugged and eventually tickets were opened and I went there and I noticed that the devices were plugged, uh, unplugged and uh, I was not amused. But by now we have resolved this and discussed it, but also just made some threats and resolved it this way. I had in one case problems with uh, residents uh, close by. So we have a setting where one of our institution is on the um, grounds of a youth home and I installed it in such a way that our Freifunk offer also um, 
reached uh, the signal reached the area outside where I thought the youths would also be interested in having internet and then eventually there were complaints because the kids always um, were hanging out in front of the house and so this was the exact text of the um, complaint and if it was my private installation I would have just kept it this way because in my opinion that's how it is but because it's a business installation and the colleagues um, locally had to have this, these fights I changed it so that the Freifunk Wi-Fi doesn't uh, the signal doesn't reach that area anymore I'm still sad about that but I just did this um, on behalf of the colleagues so that I didn't continue this fight there's a lot of support effort um, on there isn't a lot of support effort thanks to Andreas and others um, by using the right devices if you um, don't use device of a certain provider that I missed sorry um, technically it's fairly simple what we are learning now that we've scaled up is that um, running this infrastructure with two people next to their normal tasks is uh, difficult so we always have to um, drive out to the location which takes a while and I got an offer yesterday from some cloud provi the provider called the cloud and we had a monthly difference of 8,000 euros and so that's really the employee equivalent of a full-time employee with a uh, um, their own car so if we are not including our working time we're still more profitable I have to check the clock all the time so what goes through the wires we are quite stable somewhere around the 400 more or less there's a rather stable volume, of course in the evenings there's more, and on the weekends there's more, and I have to say the offer is very well received. We just have 40 of the houses supplied so, <coughs> sorry, so far, and it's more demand than we can satisfy. So the firmware is there, the devices, some of them I can't buy, so I can't provide that, and manpower, yeah, we are also at our limit. With Freifunk we then had an agreement that we don't just use it as a hotspot, but also we are paying a point fee and many of the houses uh, many of the people in the houses also became um, members of Freifunk then we also have and just to to show it so it's not just using a hotspot so I also have to comment to, to yeah to say good things about them. They created a firmware just for us that's also signed with SSH keys, so I could do it remotely. I could work with it remotely, and that's really great. And that's something that came by chance more or less because I just met them because of geography and because those people I met are very very good okay what I would like to do in the future and what was planned back then so we have these houses and we have housing office so there's also seminar rooms, pub, community rooms, and my idea back then was that we could use it for local networking as well. Ultimate volunteers, people working in the houses and so on. But that was a very naive idea 
Strukturen in der Fläche von Freifunk. That was before I knew the structures of Freifunk. That's not about the ones I'm, we are working with in Neanderland, but the other ones, Klebe, Niederrhein. At some places there is no Freifunk. And uh, there is just no one I could bring into our house. And yeah, we will. What, another thing is to teach media competence to our customers, because there is a risk that they do criminal things in the internet by accident, just because they don't know. For some time we had these talks in the evening, what to take care of when you are on the internet, but we just don't have time. We want to build up the options for digital, digitally taking part. So with the cyber feeble together, and the pixel networks, we want to bring that to the places and wherever there is active Freifunk people who are not necessarily in Neanderland, so we can offer them that they can use our structures, our, our rooms, that we are willing to sponsor access points or yeah, access. And yeah, I would really like to not only take, but also contribute. This benefit, I imagined it bigger, naively, at the beginning, so the benefit I, of what I can give back. And whenever I talk to uh, people living in our houses, that wherever we manage to do it, people really like it. And really soon they're also using smart TVs and so on, especially during COVID. You have to imagine, if one in these houses, one of the 24 has COVID, then the whole house is under quarantine for 10 days. So you can't go out anymore. And if you just have a uh, just a normal phone contract and you stream on YouTube that lasts for three days. So they are very thankful for a free internet offer. And I think since three years we are productive with this and the quality of hardware and software, also firmware, is fantastic. I have to say. So with professional devices, what I see, they die a lot more often and a lot quicker in my experience. So we can, you can notice that it is on the basics of hobbyists, but it's very high quality, both the recommendations and also the things they provide themselves. So we are very happy. Our customers are very happy. And what we can see, the throughput, the bandwidth, it's really in high demand. So if something goes down, we have our own monitoring, of course, but we get a call quite quickly as well. And for us, it usually means if we can't solve it remotely, that we so we do have remote access so we can reboot things, but sometimes we just have to go there 50 kilometers, pull the plug, or sometimes just the cleaning lady unplugged it and forgot to plug it back in. That happens. And if we are there for other reasons anyway, then okay. So if we are there anywhere for other reasons, where we don't have Freifunk, but they know that we offer that, they are friendly, but they are intense in their demands to get it as well. So in my experience, after three years in production, is that outside of Freifunk, I couldn't have done this. It would have been too expensive. And I'm very, very happy to have had met those people I met and could, I'm able to work with them and we have benefit we can give back and after COVID we can open up our houses as well. Who wants more information can write me an email or 
phone me on my work phone. The number is on the screen. If there are further questions or wants to know certain specific implementations or wants to help or, or, or for all of these points. Am I within my time? Yes, but there are also the options for questions. I would start with the first question. Why exactly did you choose the Archer C7? Because there are cheaper ones. So the colleague of Andreas Dorfer re recommended uh, C7 to me and I googled it a bit and the C7 has oh, in this area I think I can get it for 50 euros at the moment. It doesn't really matter for me that there are cheaper options because the important thing is it has to be put there and then can't go out anymore. And then I'm ready to pay a bit more money for this and I don't have to pick the cheapest option. And the R7 has a better equipment and the experience is that you can't break these things. We've put those up, we've turned them on and since then I haven't visited them anymore and that is uh, there's a small price difference, 20, 30 difference. It doesn't really matter that much to me uh, if it saves one trip back to the institution and it's already great. So this was in the end a recommendation by Andreas Dorfer. I looked a bit into it a bit more. Is it reserved by the? Is it supported by the firmware? Does it have uh, reserve capacity? And we've been very happy with it. Uh, power is working well, it doesn't have problems with um, power spikes or something, and we've noticed this with some other models, if we have them in the same room with other things, then it's not always clearly decoupled. We also had routers that just um, turned themselves off or something. Since we have the C7, that's not a problem anymore, and we don't have to look into the electrotechnics, so that's why we use that one. Okay. And because it's well available on the market. Another question. If you would have to decide again, would you choose Freifunk again? Yes, definitely. Definitely. So, with both um, souls, with my private one and also with a professional one, even if I usually um, look into service level agreements and try, like to delegate things, I would have chosen Freiburg, Freifunk here again because it's scalable and I still hope to have these benefits when Corona is over and it's a way, a wonderful way to support civic engagement and it's great to see it works. I'm still very happy when I look into the management. I would do it again. Perfect. There are no further questions for the moment, but I think you just had your contact info on screen. If people are curious, they can contact you directly. Thank you very much for the very informative talk. After the stream, you can also provide feedback, give feedback to the speakers, what they could improve, maybe. Otherwise, thank you very much. And also thank you for your attention from the translation booth.